So welcome back everybody um, to our new normal. Here is your very first and also my very first attempt at putting together a video PowerPoint lecture. Uh, my hope is that it's going to be pretty similar to what you had in class except for you're at home and I'm at home. So um, here we are, Chem 136, video PowerPoint lecture, we're going to call it number one. And before break, we had begun our chapter on gases. So we're going to call this one gases continued. So let's go. Um, so when you talk about gases, when you describe the behavior of gases, we use four different properties. Those properties are pressure, denoted with a capital P. They are volume, denoted with a capital V. Temperature, which is denoted with a capital T. And our fourth um, property is the number of moles, which is denoted by a lowercase n. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at each one of these individually so you understand each one of them uh, better. So let's start with our pressure. Pressure, remember, is denoted with a capital P. What is pressure when we talk about the pressure of a gas? pressure of a gas is caused by the collisions of the molecules of the gases with the walls of the container in which you're holding the gas. Force mathematically is equal to, um, or I mean sorry, pressure is mathematically equal to the force per unit area. You've all heard the term air pressure. If you follow the weather, they'll talk about the air pressure. They'll give you that, um, that feature. And all that is, is the force exerted on you by the weight of the very, very tiny air molecules. So you might be wondering, how do we measure air pressure? Well, that dapper young man on the right of your screen is credited with building the first um, uh, instrument to measure pressure, atmospheric pressure. And it's called uh, the barometer. Uh, the man is Evangelista Torricelli, and he did it way back in the 17th century. So again, the name of the device that measures uh, atmospheric pressure is the barometer and it comes from two words I believe they're Latin in origin I could be wrong um, barrow meaning weight and meter meaning to measure so you're measuring the weight of the air on you all right so what did that early barometer look like um, it was pretty simple uh, all it consisted of was a small container, all right, of mercury, liquid mercury, and an inverted capillary tube about, uh, I'm going to say, probably a little bit over a yard high. And the weight of the atmosphere presses down on the mercury and that causes the mercury to rise inside the capillary tube. Um, normal pressure, normal atmospheric pressure at sea level is 760 millimeters of mercury, which means the atmosphere pressing down can support a column of mercury 760 meter millimeters high so you know that uh, air pressure changes on a daily basis if you follow the weather 
on hot sunny days and i hope we get a whole lot more of them to kill this crazy covid 19 virus but on hot sunny days um, the air is more dense and you have uh, greater pressure and consequently the mercury rises higher rainy days however the air is less dense less pressure and so that mercury level drops and is lower than 760 millimeters of mercury changes in altitude you're going to see a difference in air pressure from being near the ground when you're near the ground okay near sea level with the entire weight of the atmosphere on top of you all right the atmospheric pressure is going to be greater as you go up in altitude climb a mountain like in denver colorado okay um you have less of the atmosphere above you less of the atmosphere above you means less air pressure so the pressure goes down let's talk about diving if you um, are a diver you are going under the ocean so you not only have the weight of the atmosphere on you but you've got the weight of the water on you so uh, all of that lying above you is going to uh, put a greater pressure on you so how do we measure pressure pressure is measured um, in pressure units let's look at the units uh, these we'll call standard units of pressure well one of them very very common is the atmosphere one standard atmosphere is a standard unit of pressure that one atmosphere is equal to 101.3 kilo pascals kilo pascals is another standard pressure unit um, i believe it's the si unit and then we have in the english system we have pounds per square inch and again all of these standard units of pressure are equal to one another so they um, constitute equalities and can be used as conversion factors so you've got 14.7 pounds per square inch is equal to one standard atmosphere which is equal to 101 kilopascals another unit of pressure is millimeters of mercury one standard atmosphere or 101.3 kilopascals or 14.7 pounds per square inch is equivalent to 760 millimeters of mercury the tor is yet another standard uh, pressure unit and again uh, 760 tor would be equal to everything that is above it 760 millimeters of mercury 14.7 pounds per square inch um, 101.3 kilopascals and one standard atmosphere so uh, here we have a table of some of the various pressure units and as I said they are all equivalent to one another okay this one adds in the Pascal right kilo Pascal is is simply got the uh, prefix kilo right um, the millimeter of mercury again they're all equivalent okay um, you in this class have to be able to do conversion problems that convert between millimeters of mercury tor and atmospheres those are the requirements of this class you should be familiar with the si unit which is the pascal the kilo pascal but um, i don't believe there are any problems regarding that the syllabus simply says go between millimeters of mercury tor atmospheres okay so make sure you do problems you know how to do these you're using dimensional analysis okay all righty let's move on ah well just a reminder here forgot about this 
pressure remember is the force that's created by collisions of the air molecules with the walls of whatever container you you put the gas in okay moving on to our second property volume remember we talked about earlier the properties of a gas a gas takes the volume and the shape of its container so the volume of a gas is going to be the same as whatever container you put it in for instance let's just take as an example let's imagine that we have um, a sample of oxygen gas O2 remember oxygen is a diatomic molecule right O2 has a complete octet both of those and that's why it exists in that way all right so a sample of oxygen in a 10 milliliter vial okay remember it fills the whole container what's the volume of that oxygen it is going to be the same as the container it's going to be 10 milliliters all right moving on to our third property that we use to describe a gas temperature temperature remember is denoted with a capital T when you are working with gases it's the absolute temperature which remember is also known as the Kelvin temperature that has to be used in any of your calculations ideally if a gas were to reach a temperature of absolute zero so zero on the Kelvin scale or the absolute scale theoretically that's the coldest temperature then all motion of the gas particles would cease and they'd fall to the ground and they would be liquids so the volume of the gas would then become zero recall in the lab we use the Celsius thermometer calculations are going to use the Kelvin temperature so you've got to convert from one to the other this was back in one of our earlier chapters to go from Celsius to Kelvin we take that Celsius temperature and we add 273 okay our fourth property was number of moles denoted with a, a lowercase n moles remember from our previous chapter right is a quantity it is the amount of gas recall that the pressure of a gas is dependent upon the number of molecules that are colliding with the containers walls the amount of gas although if you're in the lab you're going to measure it in grams in any problem it's going to be expressed in moles n so remember in our last chapter how you convert from grams to moles or from moles to grams you're going to use that molar mass what else let's see so you're going to use the molar mass right of the gas all right additionally remember what we learned back in chapter seven that one mole of gas one mole of anything so one mole of gas is going to have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules of gas Avogadro's number all right so go back and review if you didn't review over vacation okay all right so we have all the properties that we use when we uh, talk about gases how do we be how do we as chemists explain the behavior of gases that's our next uh, part of this lecture chemists use a model called the kinetic molecular theory 
KMT for short, capital KMT. And we use this model to help visualize and understand how gases behave. So we're going to look at the tenets of the kinetic molecular theory of gases. The kinetic molecular theory of gases has assumptions, and these assumptions that we're going to cover account for the observable properties of gases. So here we go. Gases and the kinetic molecular theory. Does everybody hear that? That's our chihuahua, all right? I can't go anywhere in the house and get away from the dogs. So, you know, it is what it is. Um, how many of you guys have dogs that you can't get away from when you're trying to do your classes? I think someone rang the doorbell. Hopefully one of my adult children who are home are going to get that so the dog stops barking. Um, but anyway, back to gases and the kinetic molecular theory. Here are the assumptions. A gas consists of many particles. Particles of a gas, they're going to differ depending upon whether it's a noble gas, in which case they're atoms, right? If they're things like uh, those diatomic gases, right, or other gases, they could be molecules, right? So a gas consists of many particles. Particles can be atoms or molecules, depending upon the gas, moving about at random and very rapid velocities. All right, so best pictorial I could come up with there are, are moving gas particles, many of them, all right, random uh, motion, random velocities, okay, because they're moving around at random with rapid velocities, a gas is going to fill the entire volume of any container that you put that gas in. Additionally, if you have multiple gases in a container, they're going to mix real quickly. Second assumption of the kinetic molecular theory of gases. The attractive forces between the particles of these gases okay, are negligible. That's what keeps them far apart. Okay? And because of this, gas particles again are going to fill a container of any size and shape because they're not attracted to one another they're going to spread out and fill the container moving on to our third assumption the amount of space that's occupied by the gas particles themselves is much much smaller than the amount of space between the particles. That means there's a lot of space between the gas particles. Okay. Most of the volume then that a gas takes up is empty space. All right. So a gas, we let a gas into a container and uh, it fills the container entirely but there's space, large spaces between the particles of the gas. So most of the volume that that gas has taken up is empty space. And that's what accounts for uh, the property. Remember, we said gases are compressible, all right? The ease of compression um, of the gases, because there's so much space between the particles, you can press them and get rid of that space, put the particles closer together. And that's also what explain. this is also what explains the low densities of the gases that we talked about. 
Um, so the next assumption deals with kinetic energy, the average kinetic energy. You all know what an average is. You know how to get it from your math classes. Uh, same thing when we talk about um, kinetic energy. So it's an average kinetic energy of the gas particles because they're all moving at different speeds, right? They don't have the same speed. So if we take all of them and average them together, the average kinetic energy of gas particles is going to be proportional to that Kelvin temperature. What does this mean? How does this affect the gas? Well, gas particles have more kinetic energy. That's energy of motion, right? If a gas particle has, if the gas particles you're talking about have more kinetic energy, right, energy of motion, that means they move faster, right? Um, they're going to do so as the temperature increases, right? So it's proportional to the temperature. The higher the temperature, okay, the greater the kinetic energy, and that means the faster the gas particles move, okay? Proportional. One increases, the other increases. All right. For instance, let's just give you some uh, 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 an example. The average speed of a helium atom at room temperature, all right, room temperature, well, about 75 degrees, 25 degrees Celsius, 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 25 degrees um, Celsius, right? Okay. And atmospheric pressure, so that's one atmosphere or 760 millimeters of mercury, is approximately 1.36 kilometers per second, or since we're more familiar with miles per hour, 3,000 miles per hour. And that's nearly that of a rifle bullet. Okay, just for comparison. Okay. Okie doke. Let's see. We still have another assumption here. Collisions of gas particles, either with other gas particles or with the wall of their container, are what we call elastic. What does that mean? That means that the total kinetic energy of the particles is constant, all right? Typically, if two things collide together, all right, two particles collide together, one of them's going to slow down, maybe one's going to speed up, or both of them are, all right? So collisions of gas particles, when they collide together, it doesn't slow them down. It's perfectly elastic. They just bounce off one another and continue on in their direction. Um, and the kinetic energy, their energy of motion does not change. Okay. So um, how does that affect the properties of gas? Well, the pressure of a gas, remember, against the walls of a container, that's collisions, right? Um, pressure is a result of collisions of the gas with the walls of the container. Okay. The number on the force of the collisions is what determines the pressure. So the more collisions you have, that means the more um, pressure you have, right? So, okay. So those are all of the assumptions, the KMT, the kinetic molecular theory assumptions. Let's take them all and use them to explain the behavior of gases. All right, so the kinetic molecular theory, we said it is what helps uh, chemists account for some of the behaviors of gases that we observe. For instance, all right, one of them that we observe, if someone opens a, a bottle of perfume at one end of the room that you're in, okay, we smell that perfume at the opposite end of the room. Why? Why do we smell it eventually at the opposite end of the room? 
Well, because the gas particles, what did kinetic molecular theory tell us about them? They move uh, quickly in random directions, right, rapidly, and they spread out and fill the space that they're in, right? So they come out of that jar, they're moving rapidly, they're going to uh, continue moving and spreading out as, with great distances between them because there's no attractive forces, and eventually they hit us at the other end of the room. Okay, so that's why we said, okay, alrighty, remember um, the kinetic energy, right? The link with kinetic energy and, and temperature, right? At the same conditions of temperature, all gases, doesn't matter which one you're talking about, all gases are going to have the same average kinetic energy. Average kinetic energy mathematically is given as, um, let's see if I can do this. Can I do the pen here and mark this up? Let's see if we can. Okay. So, yeah, we're experimenting here. So, there, I'll look what I can do, sort of. Um, mathematically, kinetic energy is equal to one half m, which is mass times velocity squared, okay? Um, at the same temperature, then, right, if they all have the same average kinetic energy, remember there's going to be small molecules of gas and there are going to be larger molecules of gas, right? But if they're both at the same temperature, in order to have the same kinetic energy, right, small molecules are going to have a small mass. Large molecules are going to have a large mass, right? In order for kinetic energy to be the same, that would mean that a small molecule moves faster, has a higher velocity than a large molecule in order to have that same kinetic energy, all right? So at the same temperature, small molecules of gas are going to move faster than larger molecules. And that's because of the mathematics of kinetic energy. Okay. So there, let's, let's just remind you, ooh, ooh. Um, so small molecules, I, I uh, triple star it. Remember what I said, when I triple star something, that means it's important, okay? I, except for it's being covered up here. Ah! Um, so small molecules, I'll read it and make sure you get it in your notes. So small molecules have smaller masses. That's what we said, right? Therefore, their velocity has got to be higher in order to make that kinetic energy the same as for a larger molecule, okay? All right, very good. Um, you might recall when we started talking about gases before um, our spring break, um, and I, we, were, we were talking about some of the properties of, of gases that made them different from liquids and solids. I had mentioned two words, and we said that later on in the lecture, we would uh, see more about it. And uh, one of those words was diffusion. Gases diffuse, I told you. And so here we are. Let's see what diffusion means. Okay. Diffusion uh, describes the mixing of gases. All right. So we see here a container where we have two different gases and they are separated. Okay. The red gas on one side and the white gas on the other side. All right. Diffusion again, describes the mixing of gases. The rate of diffusion is the rate, of course, of the mixing of gases. All right, so if we were to open up this, uh, this wall, right, and allow the gases to mix, what happens? 
right? They diffuse, okay? The gases diffuse. They mix. Diffusion is the result of that property that we talked about in the kinetic molecular theory of gases, right? Diffusion is the result of the random movement of the gas molecules. So let's pull in some of the things that we talked about. Remember, there was a, a relationship between kinetic energy of the gases and, um, and temperature, right? Kelvin temperature. So the rate of diffusion, how quick a gas, uh, a couple gases mix, right, um, is going to increase with an increase in temperature because we said the kinetic energy of a gas increases with the Kelvin temperature. Okay, how about comparing small molecules diffusion to larger? Okay, small molecules are going to diffuse faster than larger molecules. Remember, small molecules have a greater velocity. Okay. All right. Let's look at another um, example where we use the kinetic molecular theory to describe gas behavior. Let's think about a nice hot sunny day when uh, you're in your car, okay? On a hot day, what happens to those tires of your car? The tire expands. Why? Because temperature of the air in the tire is increasing and that increases the motion of the air molecules in the tire. Increased motion of the particles, what's going to happen? Those air uh, molecules are going to hit the walls of the tire more, right? The more collisions with the tire wall, the greater the pressure. Too much pressure, though, and that tire is going to burst. And then what happens come fall, all right, on, uh, on the cold days, right, as the temperature changes and we come into fall, um, how many of you get those low tire pressure readings on your car nowadays? On a cold day, right, temperature goes down, okay, the molecules move slower, molecules of gas move slower, not as many collisions with the wall of the tire, and consequently the pressure goes down. Okay, so we've used our kinetic molecular theory to describe the behavior of gases. All right, on to the topic of boiling the air, um, B-O-Y-L-I-N-G, the air. So the granddaddy, as we say, of gas experts was an English scientist by the name of uh, Robert Boyle, B-O-Y-L-E. So that's where this title comes from. Or after he became famous, he was knighted. So he um, is now referred to as Sir Robert Boyle. Okay, what did he do and why are we talking about? He discovered that when gases were exposed to either increased or decreased pressures, their behavior became highly predictable. And from this, he developed a law, all right, which he tacked his name to because he did it, Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law says that pressure, the pressure of a gas, is inversely proportional. Okay, so let's see if I can do this again. Um, I want to use a, a bigger, eh, maybe not. All right, let's, let's go back to the same one. So the big thing, the operative words here are inversely proportional. Okay, to volume. 
the pressure of the gas is inversely proportional to volume when temperature is held constant. So remember, we have those four properties that we talk about with the gas, all right? And uh, we don't want to change all of them all at once, right? If we want to study a gas, we want to keep some constant. So when temperature is held constant, Sir Robert Boyle found out that pressure, capital P, and here is this um, sign right here is a proportionality sign, okay? Right here, proportionality sign. Right there, proportionality sign. Okay, from your early math classes, okay, inversely proportional one over volume at constant T. So that mathematically, that's what Boyle uh, found out from his studies with gases. All right, so what do you have to know? Because we're not going to be doing any of the math of this. All right, so what does that mean for you? It means if you increase the pressure on a gas filled object all right and let's just say that object is a balloon okay. if you increase the pressure on something the volume is going to do the exact opposite that's what it means to be inversely proportional so at constant temperature the pressure increases right as the pressure increases um, the volume is going to decrease Okay. Boyle's law would also work in the opposite direction. Again, at constant temperature, if the pressure is decreased, the volume is going to increase. That's what it means to be inversely proportional. Um, so let's just look at Boyle's law here and let's take um, a balloon. Okay. And this balloon is in San Diego. So San Diego is near the ocean, right? California, okay. Sea level, and what did we say at sea level? Okay, increase the pressure, right? And the volume goes what? Down, so notice the size of the balloon. Let's take that balloon and travel with that balloon. Same number of moles, same number of temperature, right? We haven't changed the, what's in there. Okay, and let's go to, that says Denver, Colorado there, okay, and what did we say in Denver? It is a higher altitude, correct, right, so the pressure, or less air molecules on you, and uh, lower pressure, correct, okay, so inversely proportional, when the pressure goes down, what happens with the volume? The volume increases, and our balloon has expanded. Okay, so Boyle's law, pressure and volume of a gas are inversely proportional. All right, well, there's a diving application to Boyle's law. The lungs, they are similar to a balloon with a fixed amount of air in them. As the diver comes up from the depths, remember there's a lot of pressure, right? Lots of pressure on your lungs. And what did we say? The volume, right, is low. As the diver goes up, the pressure decreases. And what happens to the volume? Inverse, right? So if the pressure is decreasing, the volume is increasing right well, the lungs are only so big right so that diver has got to make sure that he slash she exhales as they're coming up in order to prevent an overexpansion of the lungs right the lungs can only take so much if it doesn't they're going to burst okay whoops ah okay Let's go back. Hold on a sec. <gasps> well, never mind. Okay. This slide here, because I can't go back for some reason, this slide here is a, simply a graph of Boyle's law, exactly what we said. Boyle said at constant temperature, right? Um, he studied 
the relationship between the pressure of a gas and the volume and what is it showing as the pressure is increasing right the volume is decreasing as volume is increasing right the pressure is decreasing so Boyle dealt with the effects of pressure and volume that's what's hiding under my picture over here okay all righty he didn't at all consider the effect of temperature he held temperature constant in all of his studies all right so that opened up a possibility for other scientists and sure enough along came Jacques Charles and Joseph Gay-Lussac and as you can see from the graph they decided hey you know Boyle didn't study the effect of temperature right so let's look at the effect of temperature uh, and volume on a gas they explored the relationship between temperature and volume okay and this graph shows you what they found it's totally different right from Boyle's Boyle's was inverse proportion this one showing as we increase one we're increasing the other so with pressure of a gas held constant all right in a container Jacques Charles and Joseph Gay-Lussac found that the volume of a gas we're seeing it's going up right as that increases so does the temperature that means that they are proportional so let's look at Charles's law all right the volume of a gas decreases as the temperature decreases with constant P so mathematically what are we talking about Charles's law states that there is a direct relationship between temperature and volume as one increases the other increases as one decreases the other decreases so how do we show it all right again this is the mathematic relationship here we see that proportionality sign all right from your early high school math classes right okay you know that that's what that is okay directly proportional and this explains why uh, when you're having a birthday party okay and of course now you can't have a birthday party um, without so social distancing and you have to have less than 10 people there okay um, but what did we normally do we would tie a balloon to the mailbox so people could find your house right and as the day went on right that temperature got higher right what gas you had in that balloon expanded and sometimes they burst okay but those that didn't all right um by nighttime and the next morning okay when it got cooler at night that balloon shrunk down to absolutely nothing okay so charles's law direct relationship right between volume and temperature as the volume goes up temperature goes up volume goes down temperature goes down all right so gay lussac's law Gay-Lussac was Charles's colleague all right he took it a step further and he investigated the relationship between temperature and pressure okay so Boyle what was Boyle Boyle was pressure and volume okay Charles was temperature and volume and Gay-Lussac was here's the new one temperature and pressure so in order to study temperature and pressure relationship he kept the volume constant all right so he noted when he kept the volume the same there was a direct relationship between Kelvin temperature Kelvin temperature okay remember we talk about Kelvin temperature right okay and pressure 
All right. So direct relationship as one goes up, the other goes up. So temperature increases, pressure increases. It's also the same the other way. If temperature decreases, the pressure is going to decrease. Okay, they do the same thing. One follows the other. Again, here is that uh, the mathematical relationship pressure proportional to Kelvin temperature. And there's that proportionality sign. Okay. Again, we're not going to be doing any of the calculations. You just have to look at models, um, balloons, etc., and be able to tell what happens. All right. <clears throat> All right. Okay. So, molecular motion of gas, right? How fast uh, a gas, mole the gas molecules move. We know already that it increases as temperature increases, right? They move faster. The faster that they move, okay? What's true? They're in a container. The faster they move, the more collisions that gas will have with the walls of their container. And the more collisions, what happens? The greater the pressure. So with a constant volume, so we're not changing the volume of the gas, right? Pressure, and pressure, let's remind you, is the force of the particles, right? The force of the particles hitting the container wall. I don't like the thin one. I gotta figure out how to do a thicker underline or maybe a highlight for next time. Whatever. Um, okay, so with constant volume, not changing the volume, can't change everything and, and study things. You gotta keep some of them constant. So, constant volume, he found. The pressure, which is the force of the molecules, the particles hitting the container walls, is going to increase. And that makes sense. It makes sense from the kinetic molecular theory. All right. So this is a graph of uh, Gay-Lussac's law. Okay. Again, note the difference between Charles's law, which is a direct relationship between two properties, and Gay-Lussac's law, again, a, a direct relationship between pressure and Kelvin temperature. As one increases, the other increases, right? Or as one decreases, the other decreases. Totally different from the graph of uh, Boyle's law, which was an inverse relationship. Okay? Make sure you understand the difference. All right. Okay. Moving on to our next topic and we're almost done incidentally with our our gases here all right we only have a handful more slides here so mixed gases a lot of gases are not uh just one gas they're mixtures they have many gases all right mixed together for instance most common mixed gas is the air that we breathe. It's a mixture of gases. Well, John Dalton, who was an English scientist and school teacher, he uh, studied the behavior of gas mixtures. All the others, incidentally, uh, they did their studies on just single gases, uh, not mixtures. All right, so back to, to Dalton, who studied the mixtures. What did he find? He found that in a mixture of gases, each of the gases in the mixture is going to demonstrate its own individual behavior. In other words, it's going to behave as if the other gases weren't there at all. It's going to totally ignore the other gases and just go about and do its own thing. Okay, how many of you have friends like that, right? You could be together in a group, right? But they're sort of just doing their own thing, okay? Um, each gas, therefore, 
Remember, gases exert pressure when you have them in a container. So if you have a mixture of gases and they're each doing their own thing, hitting the side of the container, right? Each gas is going to exert its own what we call partial pressure, the, part, the pressure from its uh, particles hitting the walls of the container. All right, it's called the partial pressure. Okay. All right, and from his studies, he developed what is called Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures, which says for a mixture of gases in a container, the total pressure, total pressure means, uh, let's see here, I need to have a different color because this is red. So the total pressure, total pressure means the pressure of every single gas in the mixture, okay, can be gotten by taking the partial pressure Remember, they're all behaving individually, bumping the size of the container, creating pressure on their own. So let's imagine a mixture of three gases, okay? Uh, gas number one would exhibit its own partial pressure. Gas number two would exhibit its, and gas number three. And if we had more, they'd each have their own partial pressure. If we want the total pressure of everything, that a whole mixture of gases, we simply add together all the individual partial pressures of all the, the gases. So this one, you are going to have problems where you have to calculate, but this is easy, okay? All it is is simple addition, okay? So let's, let's give you an example, all right, of the type of problem, very simple one, and then make sure you do problems in the book. All right. Um, what is the total pressure of a tank of helium and argon gas? OK. When. All right. So the problem tells us that the pressure due to helium. All right. So that's the partial pressure from helium is three atmospheres and the pressure of the argon gas. Right. Is two atmospheres. So they want the total pressure. So they want this. And all we have to do is add these together. So the total pressure is equal to three atmospheres plus two atmospheres, and that gives us five atmospheres. Things to watch out for in these kinds of problems. Sometimes they give you um, the, sometimes they will give you a total pressure, okay? They'll give you this quantity here, and sometimes they'll give you maybe one of these, right? Okay, and they will ask you to calculate another. Okay, so those are a different level of problem regarding Dalton's law. Let me think about some other, other things that they do. Aha, yes, sometimes. Let's use a different color here to show you that I'm doing something else here. So sometimes these problems will, uh, you've got to watch out for this. They will give you the pressure, the partial pressure of one, uh, let's say in atmospheres. Notice that, that this is in atmospheres, right? Okay. And this is also in atmospheres, right? So they are the same unit and we can add them together, right? Remember you can add apples and apples, but you can't add apples and oranges. Um, so sometimes they might uh, give you one of these in another um, pressure unit, and you're going to have to convert them to the same unit, all right? So just watch for those, okay? All right. Let's see what else. Okay. So that's Dalton's Law. We move on to Avogadro's Law, all right? Avogadro's Law. Remember him? Okay, Avogadro's number, right? 6.022 times 10 to the 23 particles in one mole of a substance. Okay, let's see what he had to say and what he studied. Probably moles, right? Avogadro studied the relationship between volume, capital V, and what, look at that, moles, right? For a gas, 
when temperature and pressure are held constant. Okay, so what did he find? He found that there was a, there it is, direct relationship, okay, between what this time? Volume of the gas and number of moles at constant temperature and pressure, okay? So there we have it. We've seen this before, right? There's our proportionality symbol. Volume is directly proportional to moles. What does that mean, directly proportional? What did we say? If volume goes up, moles goes up. Or if moles goes up, volume goes up. And then the exact opposite. If volume goes down, the number of moles of gas goes down. Okay. So what does that mean, the consequences of this direct relationship? That means any two gases are going to have equal volumes if they have the same number of moles of gas at the same temperature and pressure. Hmm. That's important. That brings us to something called standard temperature and pressure, known as STP. Standard temperature and pressure is a set of conditions. Oh, okay. Standard temperature is zero. That should be a superscript, right? Zero degrees Celsius. Or since we use Kelvin temperature, right? Okay. It would be 273 Kelvin. So that's the standard temperature, right? And the Celsius scale and the Kelvin scale. So we say standard temperature and pressure. So what's standard pressure? Well, standard pressure is one atmosphere, which is also equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, remember. Okay. Well, keeping in mind Avogadro's law, right, and what it tells us, right, at STP, at standard temperature and pressure, one mole of any gas occupies 22.4 liters. Okay, so that's the volume of one liter of any gas, or I'm sorry, that's, that's the volume of one mole of any gas at standard temperature and pressure. So the conditions have to be zero degrees Celsius, one atmosphere. Okay. Remember, we had the molar mass of substances, right? Well, this 22.4 liters of a gas is known as the molar volume of a gas. And this molar volume can be used as a conversion factor in calculations, the same way we used the molar mass in calculations, right? Okay. Let's show you. Let's give you an example of how we can use this molar mass. All right. But again, remember, there is a condition on this 22.4 liters, right, of a gas. One mole, right? One mole occupies 22.4 liters. Um, and that is it's at standard temperature and pressure. Okay. Ooh, things are happening here. I don't know what's happening to my, no, oh, okay, my picture sort of went crazy. All right, so here's our, our practice problem, okay? What is the volume in liters occupied by 49.8 uh, grams of HCl at standard temperature and pressure? All right, so what do we know? Standard temperature and pressure. So you have to recognize that when a problem tells you standard temperature and pressure. Okay. That means 
that the temperature is zero degrees Celsius or that 273, right? You can use 273.15 if you want Kelvin, right? Okay, what else is it telling us? Well, it's also telling us we have a pressure of one atmosphere. Okay, all right. Well, remember, we don't typically use grams, right? We use moles. So let's take this 49.8 grams and let's convert it to moles using the molar mass of HCl, right? So 49.8 grams times, we're going to go to the periodic table and we're going to look at chlorine, right? Uh, and get its atomic weight, right? Okay, in AMUs, we'll switch it to grams. We'll get the atomic uh, mass of hydrogen, which will be in AMUs. We'll switch it to grams, right? Add them together. And we've got this molar mass, which is a conversion factor, right? Okay, we want to go from grams, right, to moles. So one mole of HCl over 36.45 grams. Okay, um, so notice what cancels, right? Our grams is going to cancel, and we are left with moles, right? That's the unit that we want, because that's what we talk about when we talk about gases. Okay, all right, so we have, we have a gas, right? 49.8 grams of it at standard temperature and pressure. What do we know to be true? Okay. Well, we know that there are 22.4 liters of a gas is equivalent to one mole of a gas. Okay. Or one mole of a gas occupies 22.4 liters. So that becomes our conversion factor liters on the top, moles on the bottom, moles cancels, right, our 1.37 moles of our HCl cancels. We are left then with liters, and we do our calculation. Hopefully it's correct. If, if it's, I'm counting on y'all to do the math and, and make sure I'm correct. If I'm incorrect, uh, please, please, please um, send me a message in Canvas. Okay, and I will quickly change it. I'll change the PowerPoint, okay, um, and let everybody know, okay? Alrighty, so there are a few of these problems in the text that you should be able to do, okay? Very, very good. Let's see. Well, that's it. That's the end of our very first um video PowerPoint lecture. We made it all the way through uh, and finished chapter eight. Okay, so remember we said we have a quiz coming up this Sunday and it uh, covers the material from the lecture before our world changed, right? Okay, which was chapter seven. Okay, uh, moles, etc., and all those conversions, and all of the gas chapter, which we started again before break, and now we just finished it, and um, we're going to add in solutions. All right, so um, stay tuned. Okay, and then go to the second um, video PowerPoint lecture.